That ought to work. Okay, Chris. Well, good evening, everybody. My name's Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. That um, inform people about AA because AA doesn't promote itself and hire an advertising agency. And uh, one of them was Liberty Magazine, where there was a story AA and God, or alcoholics and God. And it was kind of a religious. Thing, but it did get a few inquiries, but not as many as the other one. And the other one was concerned a baseball player for the Cleveland Indians named Raleigh Helmsley. Now, Raleigh Helmsley was an all-star catcher in the 30s and 40s for the Cleveland Indians and caught Bob Feller, who, when I was growing up, you said Bob Feller, and you went, that's the fastest pitch there is. And he was a pretty famous pitcher. Well, Helmsley's uh, performance as a baseball player began to drop off significantly as his alcoholism <laughs> progressed. He was able to keep it under control for a while, but as time took its toll, his um, performance slacked and his batting average dropped and the manager of the Cleveland Indians became concerned and he, through a friend or some little story, heard about the Oxford group. Um, and there was a group in Cleveland, because AA hadn't been started. So he went to the uh, Oxford group and he said, how much to get Helmsley sober? Because he's a very valuable player to us, and we will pay good dollars to get. Of course, the Oxford Group is going. No, there's no money involved. Um, but he he has to join an Oxford Group, and we are getting some alcoholic sober in these groups. As a matter of fact, we have a hospital in Akron, which is where he has to start out. And of course, that was Dr. Bob down in St. Thomas Hospital in Akron. And the manager said, well, he won't go to a hospital. There's no way. I've tried to talk to him about it. He doesn't like how he's not going to go to a hospital. And the Oxford group says, well, unless he goes there, there's nothing that can be done. So they finagled with an opposing pitcher to deliberately hit him. <laughs> And then the trainer ran out, and it was a very minor injury, but he declared that he had to go to the hospital. The injury was, <laughs> was so bad, and so off they shipped him down to Akron, and he had no idea what was coming, but um, he was on his way to getting sober, which he did. And. Um, as he developed one and two years sobriety moving into 1941, his performance on the field skyrocketed. His batting average goes up and he's not making any errors and he's throwing people out at second and it was, wow. So the reporters are coming around and they're going, to what do you owe this? How come you're suddenly doing so well? He said, oh, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and everything is turning out wonderful. And they said, oh, really? Well, tell us all about it. Well, you know, this little organization, I go down, and they work on me. <laughs> it's just amazing what they're doing. Well, that story went in all kinds of major newspapers in the sports sections, and sporting enthusiast alcoholics read it. <laughs> And some of them said, well, if it's good enough for Raleigh Helmsley, it's good enough for me. So we see an early example of uh, anonymity breaks doing some good. Um, and Bill was, they didn't really capture the anonymity till a little bit later. And there were, people were getting their picture taken and the, when they did the Jack Alexander article. There was a picture taken of AA members. Now the other character that was uh, played a predominant role at this time was a very famous AA who got sober in 1938, probably AA number 10 or 11, and his name was Clarence Snyder. <coughs> now Clarence's story is absolutely amazing. 
uh, he, I think he was born in 1902 in Cleveland, was a super everything, super salesman, super anything, that athlete, dancer, you just name it, until drinking came along and he was one of those alcoholics that wham, when it hit, it hit like a ton of bricks. So he had gotten married and um, his wife, who also joined AA later on, became very concerned with his drinking because he's being fired from everything and she's trying to get him to go to a hospital and he's now uh, just drinking around the clock like a crazy man and totally unpredictable and she was thinking of having him locked up, reaching her last straw with him and her brother was a truck driver. So she said to her brother, what if you have Clarence stay with you in the truck and if you keep him up in that compartment on the top of the truck while you drive all over the country there's no way that he can get drunk which is true and so they started off on this truckers Daniel you'll appreciate this on this trucking route with Clarence up in the thing there well of course there's a few days without a drink he's going nuts in there and he's trying to dream up things to tell his brother and his brother was tired and everything and Clarence said look why don't you go get a meal freshen up and I'll guard the truck while you're gone <laughs> and of course guarding the truck included going down to some gin mill and getting some cheap whiskey and coming back and his brother finds him drunk guarding his truck <laughs> and that ended the relationship and he said they were on their way to New York City and he just dumped them he just dumped them on the streets in New York City and Clarence is trying to survive there and he had a sister-in-law that lived there that he had befriended earlier and really did a lot of things for I mean really saved her house and did some tremendous things and he figured she really owed me a favor so he calls her and says, you remember all the things I did? Well, maybe I could come by. Oh, yeah, sure, Clarence. And she, she wasn't aware of the exact condition that he was in. And when he came over, she just slammed the door on him and just said, I'm sorry, but I'm not helping you. You just stay out there. And um, somehow he worked his way back to Ohio and decided to return to his wife. And he came home and she looked at him through the door and knew better than to open it. And just started telling him, uh, no, you're not coming in. I know it sounds hard, but I'm not, you're not getting in. And he said, well, I hope I'm going to die and it's hopeless, it's hopeless. And the funny thing is that her sister had called her telling her that Clarence had been there and also that her sister had heard from a doctor in New York that there was a doctor in Akron that could help Clarence. And the doctor in New York was Bill's brother-in-law, Leonard Strong, who was a big player in getting Bill to see Rockefeller. He paid for Bill to go to Towns Hospital. He's a, his name is pretty well known in AA history. And that's where Clarence found out about Dr. Bob was through uh, Bill's brother-in-law. Anyway, he hemmed and hawed about going down there, um, trying to get his wife to give him the travel money to go to Akron <laughs> on the bus. And she knew if he gave him the travel money to go to Akron, he would drink the travel money and he would still be there outside her door in Cleveland. <laughs> So she went down to the bus company with him, bought the ticket, and made him get on while she was watching, so they stamped the <laughs> ticket and he couldn't get a refund out of it. And then she followed the bus for the first time. <laughs> for the two other stops in Akron until it hit the main road for Cleveland, I mean the other way around, until it hit the main road for Akron, and off he went. <laughs> and was dumped out there and um, finally made his way to see Dr. Bob. And um, 
he, they check him in the hospital. And this is how the Akron, uh, the Oxford group worked back then. They checked him in the hospital, and he recovered physically for three or four days. Then Dr. Bob came by, he was a big man, and he said, all right, son, you're ready. And he said, ready for what? He said, ready for God. <laughs> son, I want to know something. I want to know it right now. Do you believe in God? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. No, you can't be not sure. You either <laughs> believe or you don't. Now, what's your decision? What's your, well, maybe I guess so. No, you don't get so. Yes or no? Um, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> When you're sitting in a little short nighty on a bed with four days sobriety. He said, okay, I do. Okay, get on your knees. Why? Because we're going to pray. In this little short nighty? Yeah, get down on the... So he got down there, and this is what Clarence said Dr. Bob told to him. They got down on the knees, and Dr. Bob looked up and said, Jesus... This is Clarence Snyder. He's a drunk. <laughs> Clarence, this is Jesus. <laughs> you ask him to help you stop drinking and to manage your life. Okay. Uh, Jesus, could you please manage my life and help me keep sober? And then he stood him up and he said, Good man, you're on your way. Now go back to Cleveland, Akron, I mean Cleveland, and start sobering up drunks. He's only got a week sobriety. <laughs> Go back to Cleveland, start sobering up drunks. Because you weren't an official member until you brought back somebody and then they got sober, then you were in. You are now a full-fledged member. Now Clarence is a good salesman and he's back there talking to people right and left because he wants to hurry up and get somebody to go down to Akron with him. And he was going to weekly meetings in the uh, Williams home, which is where the AAs in Akron were meeting with the Oxford people. A wonderful couple. When you go out to Akron, that's on the tours to go by the Williams home. Anyway, he's not getting anybody. The drunks are just listening, but he's not closing any deals with these guys. <laughs> And he runs across a guy with alcoholic paralysis. Uh, this is one of my favorite AA stories of all times. <laughs> Alcohol paralysis is where you're lying on the ground and you can't move, but you're conscious. <laughs> so you can talk and people can talk to you, but you can't get away. <laughs> so Clarence, can work on closing the deal as long as he wants. The guy can't get away. So he's kneeling down by his side. And I'm telling you, going to do, you going, do you want to get sober? You going, yeah, I'm going to take you down to Akron. They got a hot, I don't, want, I don't want to do any of that. And he just keeps pressuring and pressuring. And finally he says, okay. And he says, well, have you got 50 bucks? It costs 50 bucks to go through um, Dr. Bob's hospital. That ain't bad for five days in a hospital. And he said, no, I haven't got any money. I and mean, who had money lying in Skid Row? He said, but my mother, if she knew that I was willing to go to the hospital to recover from being a drunk, she would advance the $50 just like that. And Clarence said, where does she live? Uh, this is Clarence. He's not going to wait for him to get sober and go out there. Where does your mother live? All right. And it was way out of town in the country. And he went and borrowed a car. He got somebody to loan him a car. He went right out there, you know, that same day and drove out. And pretty soon the regular road ended. He's on a dirt road. And pretty soon that ended. And it's kind of a trail. And the hunting season was going on. People are shooting. <laughs> and he's walking through the woods to some address out there and finally he sees it it's a small farmhouse he goes up to the door knocks on the door and this elderly woman comes and he says are you mrs. Ryan or whatever the man and she shakes her head Ryan the name and he says well I'm here because your son is laying on there and she's going mm, don't, don't, you know 
she was Polish and didn't speak English. <laughs> and so he's talking to son, her mother, his mother, but he cannot communicate. She recognized his son's name and something like that. And there was a young eight-year-old girl who was attending school and had learned English and became the translator between the two and communicated the message so that the mother gave him $50. He went back and got this man down and he got sober. And so Clarence was AA's top 12-stepper. <laughs> without a doubt. I mean, Dr. Bob had them all coming in the hospital, but we're talking about going out and getting people and bringing them down and um, he got into the automobile business. He was such a top salesman, they gave him two demonstrators. Now, not many car dealers where the salesman gets one of each type model to take home, but he did. And he used the two cars to ferry down the Cleveland contingent to the Akron meetings. That's how many people he was getting sober and he's bringing them down to the Williams house Anyway, th this is going on for a year or so, and um, he noticed that almost everybody in the car was Roman Catholic. I don't know why he had so many Roman Catholics up there in Cleveland, but his car load was almost all Roman Catholics. And something happened when the Roman Catholic guys got sober. Their churches noticed the difference and they would go up and go, Pat, you look wonderful. What's going on? Oh, Father, God is saving me. I found the Oxford group down in Akron, a Protestant organization. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not approved by the Pope. And they go, oh, Pat, you, you, you really shouldn't be going there. But Father, it's saving my life. And then pretty soon there's two other guys and then three and the church feels like it's got a rebellion on its hands. And they actually were calling them in saying if they keep going to the um, Oxford Protestant organization, there's a chance they'll be excommunicated. Now that creates a heck of a dilemma because you, you know both of them are terrible choices. And so Clarence is thinking as he's driving down there that what we need is a group outside of Oxford where we do the same thing. You follow what I'm saying? We'll just meet over here. We'll call it something else. And that way these guys can keep getting sober. So he advanced the idea to Dr. Bob. And he said, I'm thinking, uh, uh, Somebody that he brought down named Abby, driving his wife back home, he was talking about he wished he had a place where they could meet in Cleveland. She said, oh, you can use our house. It would be perfect. It's a great big house. Our children are all gone. And besides, if you're meeting there, when my husband gets out, he'll have no choice but to go. <laughs> and, uh, and so Clarence tucked that away in the back of his head, and he went down there, and he talked to Dr. Bob, and he said, you know, I got these Catholics, and they're liable to get excommunicated if they keep coming down here. So I'm thinking of starting a separate meeting up in um, Cleveland. And Dr. Bob just went berserk because he did not want to upset the Williams and all the hospitality that they had. So he was caught in a tough place. And he said, no, 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 don't do that. Well, Clarence went home and thought about it and he came back the next week and he said, I know I'm not supposed to go against my sponsor, but I'm starting that thing. And it's gonna be Thursday night at this address. And lo and behold, he did. He went up there and um, the um, Akron contingent came up and tried to stop the meeting. <laughs> but they weren't successful. And here's the th quirk in history that uh, Clarence parlayed into a lot of controversy. The big book had come out and the name Alcoholics Anonymous was now being used 
before the alcoholic squads that met separately, like it, Bill Wilson would go to the Oxford group in New York and then he'd have the drunks come over his house for a separate little meeting. And that was starting to irritate the Oxford groupers in New York, but Akron, they were more cool with that idea. And Dr. Bob just didn't want to upset them. Anyway, the book came out, and so Clarence decided that what I'm going to call this group is Alcoholics Anonymous, after the big book. Well, technically, that was the first group to call itself Alcoholics Anonymous, which if you want to use your ego and really stretch a point, you could later claim to be the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> which Clarence did boldly in the newspapers with no anonymity go on radio shows tonight we are interviewing the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> Clarence Snyder and uh, this was not going over well in New York but he was amazing he he wrote sponsorship pamphlets um, he wrote the first intergroup in Cleveland. Um, he had institution things, how to go to a jail, all kinds of stuff. And his vision for the future of AA was that the major centers around the country would do their own thing. In other words, Cleveland would put together all their pamphlets and all this and the telephone numbers and they would get the word out and they would do all that. And, Dallas could do that, and Los Angeles could do that, and the last thing we need is some central office telling all of us what to do. So you can see there is some tension building. And the second level of tension was New York, even when I got sober in D.C., you would find the old timers, you, you, they would say, let me tell you the whole program. I can condense it down to two simple things. Don't drink and go to meetings. That was the whole program. Don't drink and go to meetings. Whereas Clarence and, and, and out in Akron, it was uh, serve God, pray, help others. You follow what I'm saying? It was totally spiritual. And New York was just don't drink. What's the problem? <laughs> if you don't drink, you can't get drunk. What's the problem? <laughs> And that tension exists today. I mean, you hear, you know, New York would like to make it more psychological. The last thing I heard was that there's no groups left in New York that say the Lord's Prayer. I don't want to, that reminds me too much of religion. We're going to get rid of that. And I think they say the Serenity Prayer. And then out in Akron, we got to go back to basics. We got to go back, and you hear, we got to go back to basics, back to basics. We got to get. And between those two tensions, we got the wonderful middle ground known as our 12-step program and God as we understand him. And um, it's a real blessing. It's, it's nice to have that kind of tension because it will allow you to think about things from different perspectives. And it's still going on. And it's still going on. Somebody went to Founders Day and they brought me back a pamphlet from the Cleveland Intergroup, The Four Absolutes which were part of the thing and it was just just you read that and you realize there's no way to stay sober without them <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying and that's fundamentalism and then over here we go what are they <laughs> could you please go through them so people seem to be staying sober and happy without them but they shouldn't be able to <laughs> So I'm not taking sides. I think there's, <laughs> I think there's just, I love both of it. I think that's so healthy and I really enjoy it. Anyway, that's enough for bringing us up to where we left off last week, which was the third step. Um, and I, I'm going to keep mentioning this. I started the, the uh, discussion on our principles, et cetera, by going to the very end the 12th step, so that we see what the target is, and there it sits. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So that's the only result 
that the 12 spiritual principles are aiming at, having had that spiritual awakening. Now, you know, you hear, well, if you're just sober, if you're just this and that, that fine. But the deal here is to have that awakening yourself. It's a personal experience. And that's the jackpot. So when we go back and look at all these other steps, that's where they're pushing us. They're pushing us towards that moment in our lives, which is a transforming experience. And um, to be selected out of all of humanity to have a shot at that is really an honor. Because there aren't many groups that are shooting for that. There aren't many groups with meetings all over the place and we're sitting in there, well, I'm going to do these stuff. I mean, it's, and the only reason we're doing it is because alcohol's waiting out there. Nobody in here is a spiritual giant. We just know if we don't keep trying to do this stuff, I'm going to walk out there one day and a bottle of vodka is going to appear and go, hi. And I'm going to pick it up. And then I'm going to get beat up real bad. And so that's why I'm going to do something I really don't believe in. And I'm not inclined to even attempt. And that's how we all got here and get forced into something that is the most wonderful thing that can happen to a human being. So I don't know why we're so lucky when it looks like we were so unlucky to get here. As I said earlier, when the cop pulled you over for a DWI, little did you know that that was God's man moving you towards salvation. <laughs> he just didn't look too spiritual when he pulled me over. <laughs> but he was. So the last thing at the end of the third step was the third step prayer. I got this bookmark from the New Haven Conference. And I'm just going to read it to uh, set the stage for the fourth step. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life, may I do thy will always. These are not thoughts that I would come to naturally <laughs> in my own selfish mind. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking I wish God would build with me and so I can help others. I wish he'd just take me apart and put me back together so I can help lots of people. I don't ever remember thinking that. I said, I need some money. That was what I remember. <laughs> That's what I was, that was, this stuff is not part of our makeup, okay? It just isn't. But the third step ends with this prayer, and just for the trivia crowd, the third step also ends with a prayer in the 12 and 12. It's the only step that ends with two prayers, the serenity prayer and the third step prayer. And also for the trivia experts, the origin of the serenity prayer came about in 1941 when Ruth Hauk, they had moved the office to New York, and if you remember, Ruth Hauk was the one who typed the big book, getting stock certificates to the Works <laughs> Publishing Company. And uh, they finally moved from New Jersey to New York, and so now in 41, they're getting inquiries from around the country, and it's starting, the book is selling, and it's starting to go a little bit, and so her job was to answer correspondence. And she opened a letter one day, and in it was simply a clipping out of a newspaper that an AA member had sent in. And it was an obituary column, and an uh, obituary, not an obituary column, it was an obituary for some man. And at the end of it was the serenity prayer. And she looked at it and said, well, that's kind of interesting. So she started typing it on cards, just little cards. And then when she would respond, to an inquiry should drop a card in the envelope so the serenity prayer, <laughs> with no one knowing it except Ruth Hauk, <laughs> was slipping off to all different parts of the country where they got the card and said, that is cool, and the next thing, it's part of Kansas, it's part of California, and all over the place. So anyway, that brings us to the uh, fourth step, and what I wanted to do is, I'm not going to go through the dynamics of the fourth step. I, want to, I thought about this long and hard, and I want to talk about the big picture of the fourth step as I see it. 
And then we'll talk about the dynamics of it. But the sometimes it, to understand something, we got to have stories and things like that. So normally I don't use notes, but I had four points that I want to emphasize about the big picture of the fourth step. And the first one is, it's not about admitting your sins and then doing penance for them. It's got nothing to do with that. That's the furthest thing from the fourth step that there is. <clears throat> Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. It has nothing to do with things we've done wrong that we're going to have to make good or that we're going to suffer for, that we have to say 25 Hail Marys. It has, that is not it at all. The purpose of the fourth step, it's about awakening to a brand new world, the one that your creator made for you. That's what it's about. If awakening is the answer, then what's the problem? And this is hard to understand sometimes. If awakening is the problem, then uh, is the solution, then the problem is not realizing that we're not awake. We have no concept that there even is a problem. You, do you understand what I'm saying? We have no idea until we awaken that we were existing in a state of not realizing that we weren't awake. We were following some reality that had been there all our lives. And then as we work the steps and the, this transformation takes place, we look around and we go, you know, my family's actually a lot better than I thought they were. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Well, now you are awake to see how it really is. And so this is the state that we're in. The inventory is one of the most vital parts of achieving this awakening. It's so important, we have two steps devoted to it, four and ten. So inventory constitutes one-sixth of our <laughs> program. Did you ever think about that? It constitutes one-sixth of the AA program. And then I wrote this. So what's the deal? What's the big deal? Here's the big deal. We have to undo everything we've ever learned about the world. Oh, I don't know about that. Now, how's that for a big order? How about what an order I can't go through with it? I'm going to undo? That's what old ideas avail us nothing mean. What they're saying is we're trying to have an awakening and no longer see the material world from the old guidelines, but we're going to see it from an awakened perspective. So why the inventory? Why would that be so important? In order to explain it, I, you have to tell stories. So I'm going to tell you a story I told my granddaughter a couple of months ago out in California. And she's 12. And she was sitting out in the audience at the Oxnard Convention. And I said, with your permission, I'd like to tell my granddaughter a story. Now, why are stories important? Stories are the only way to talk about God, because nobody knows God. Nobody sees him or anything. But when we tell stories about it, then we go, oh, yeah, I see. I, I understand that. We see it at AA meetings all the time when a speaker gets up there and tells their story. And we, we see this marvelously intelligent, sympathetic person standing there, and then we hear the story of what a reprobate, hopeless <laughs> piece of junk they were, and we go, how did they get from there to there? And we go, God, there's no other way. I'm, I'm looking at God's work right in front of me. So well, how did we see that? By them telling their story. You see what I'm saying? We heard a, a God story. And every time any one of you tells your story, you're telling a God story, whether you know it or not. Because that's what's going to come across. So anyway, I said, Zoe, I'm going to tell you the truth, wink, wink, about the world. Are you ready? OK, yeah, yeah. And she was sitting out there. And I said, here's the real scoop. 
the creator of the earth is this wonderful goddess. Granddaughter, the creator has to be a goddess. And this goddess created everything that there is and loves us and is just an amazing creature. She's so big that her foot can fit between the earth and the moon. Now that's a big foot. She can take one step and get to the sun. It's just, it's just an amazing, absolutely beautiful, long robes, but the most outstanding characteristic is her hair. Her hair is just brilliant. It's just the most amazing hair you've ever seen. Her head's so big it has six billion hairs in it. And she loves each one. Knows every one of those hairs. And um, after many, many eons, she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a surprise for my hair. I'm going to create a great big theater and take my hairs to the movies. So she created a big theater in the round called Earth and plopped her hairs in to watch the show. And this movie spared no expenses. It's got earthquakes, tidal waves, wars, airplanes, elevators, technology. I mean, you just, it's just the most wonderful show to watch. And she said through her hair, she says, this is a long movie. It lasts about 75 years, so you have to remember it's just a movie, okay? Don't get wrapped up with the plot and the ooh, ooh, ooh. It's just a movie. You are the goddess's hairs attending a movie. And I said, now Zoe, you'll notice that your grandmother is no longer at the movie. She left the movie about two years ago. But she's still a hair on the goddess's head. We're all hairs on the head, and we're either in the movie or not in the movie. But nothing to worry about. That's my story to her. Corny story, but it caused her to think. And later on, she was, I'm so glad to think. I like to think that way. I like to think about that. So what could I say? about the fourth step, about the inventory. And this is the story that I came up with. The real dynamics inside of us is we are all individual slide projectors. And we project on to the big screen, planet Earth, the, uh, the, the real big screen. This is the ultimate reality. And we look up on the screen to see what's going on. And we see all kinds of stuff. Because society also has a projector going. And so we're up there, we're looking at all of this. And it's nothing more than a story that our ego is manufacturing inside of us. Puts it into a slide, puts it in, shows it up there. And we go, oh, jeez, look at that. And we've been told that the name of the game is go up to the screen and rearrange things till it's suitable. Go up there where you see it's unfair and fix it. And go up there, see you live in this little house, there's a big house. What you want to do is change it so you're in the big house up there. The secret of life is to go up and rearrange everything on the screen. The answer to everything is on the screen. You see what I'm talking about? That's where you look to see what's real and what needs to be done and what everything's all about. Now, there was a um, campaign slogan about 20 years ago. And they boiled it down to one line. And the line was, it's the economy, stupid. I don't know if you remember that. It's the economy, stupid. So I would say to all of us, the line that we should learn is, it's the projector, scoop, stupid. <laughs> it's not what's on the screen. It's what's going on inside the projector. 
that's where we got to go. That's the ticket to everything. Whoever told you to look up there didn't know what they were talking about. This is how spirituality works. We have to go inside the projector booth and see what is going on in there. We have to inventory the booth and see why everything up there is so upsetting. <laughs> and so we go inside and as we take an inventory, we find out that our ego is in charge of the show and is putting together, it just, it, it just resents everything. See the resentment? Oh yeah, God, yeah, there is resentment up there. I, I can't stand it. No wonder I'm upset. Look at what's up there. And it's projecting these slides that we're making up ourselves. And when Bill writes that, we create our own problems. That's how it's done. We make up a story or a slide, we project it on the screen, and then we react to it. And it becomes quite frightening. And I'm looking up there. And so I went in, and I'm going to tell you what I saw. I went inside the projection booth, and the guy running the projector was Frank Morgan. Any trivia people know who Frank Morgan was? He was the actor that played the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and he was running my whole show. He was in there going, Woo! Okay, watch out, bad witch coming in from one o'clock. Okay. <laughs> and if you remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz, everybody was going nuts with all this stuff. Dragons and goblins and people are jumping out and it's dangerous, don't go here, don't go there, watch out for this, watch out for that. And then they got up there and they looked around and they went, hey, who's that behind the screen? The screen fell over and there's a little old man standing there. And he went, whoops, I guess the game is up. And that's what we want to do to our ego. We want to expose the show until it says, whoops, the game is up. And so in the old days in the Western when they said get out of Dodge, I would say to all of us, it's Dorothy, it's time to get out of Oz. And the fourth step is how it's done. That is where we go in order to transform everything. We go into the projection booth and we start correcting what's inside there. And we do that by carefully inventorying resentments and fears and sex. And there's a carefully laid out plan. But this isn't being done to punish us or to, for any wrongdoing or anything. It's going in there to transform what's going to be seen on the big screen. Beautiful. The, what's really in store for us is beyond our wildest dreams. And so we need to understand this in order to be <laughs> thorough. When I started doing that, I just went, oh God, all this stuff had to be fixed and I feel terrible and this and that. I had no idea where it was leading me. And so when you look in the big book, I was thinking about this. Resentment's the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stems all forms of spiritual disease. So it turns out we've been spiritually sick. And then Bill makes this interesting sentence. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. When we fix the projector, what gets shown up there in the physical and material world is fixed. When we straighten out, when the spiritual malady, the broken projector, is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Everything else springs out. Psychological problems or whatever it is. And then later on, Bill goes, 
Our old plan was get up on the screen, see what's wrong, I gotta move this, but the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. Does that describe the situation? So is that plan working, But what we've been taught all our lives? Go fix this, go fix that. No, it's got nothing to do with theory, it has to do with results. How's your plan working? See, you're wearing a wristband from a nut war. That was what my sponsor did. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you write a book, don't put your picture on that. Okay. <laughs> So we turn back to the list. Now listen to this, for it held the key to the future. The whole key to the future is in this list that we're going to fill out in our fourth step inventory. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. I just gave you a new angle to look at it. I made up a story to see what I'm talking, what the book's talking about. We're gonna look at all of that from a different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated it. And then it says, well, how do we escape? And I wrote in here, from Oz. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Okay, I see the deal, I gotta get out of here. Well, how do we get out of Oz? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. How is this, how are we ever gonna do this? Here we go. We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully give to a sick friend. At least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. God will have me have a tolerant and kindly view of everything. You see how it's just, I'm working in here. God, can you, can you, I don't know how it's great. Could you put some, wow, hey, you're doing good work. Thank you. It, we're, it, in other words, this is the result of this kind of work. Then I wrote up uh, in my book, uh, Thanks a Lot, Society, sarcastic remark, because the <laughs> sentence says, wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Now, I don't know what you were taught, but I was taught self-reliance. You better rely on yourself. If you can't trust yourself, who are you going to trust? You have to do it. You're the man. Do it. You're the man. You're the woman. Do it. You're it. You're it. Go do it. it. Don't ask for help. You do it. What? Ooh, ooh. Real man never asks for help. No, no, no. Self-reliance. Boy, I'd like to find whoever's preaching that one. Perhaps there's a better way than self-reliance. You think there could be a better way than self-reliance? Let's see, self-reliance got me in the nut ward. Hey, maybe there could be a better way. <laughs> we think so. For we are now on a different basis, a different perspective. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role that he assigns. How does he assign us the role? Puts a slide in the projector, it goes up there and we go, oh, I see what I ought to be doing. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. Inventory is the adjustment of our spiritual self to transform everything else, including the big screen. We're at the end of the time. Thanks for your patience, and we'll all be back here next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>